You're listening to the 2018 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Program. This session features Pip Desmond and Emma Gilkerson in conversation with Kerry Sunderland. Kia ora, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kerry Sunderland, and I'm the coordinator of Readers and Writers. And it's my great pleasure to see such a big crowd here today for Family Narratives, part of the Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers. Big thank you to Page and Blackmore, our sponsor, where you can um, find copies of both Pip and Emma's books um, after the session. So we are recording uh, today for a podcast. So when we come time to questions at the end, if you could please wait for the microphone to come around to you. So that's about all the housekeeping. Oh, except for... Don't forget to turn off your phones or pop them on silent. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage today Emma Gilkinson and Pip Desmond, uh, two Wellingtonians who have written two ex extraordinary and exquisite books, I, I believe, about beloved mem members of their families. In this session, we're going to explore the heart and the craft of memoir writing. So just a quick intro, intro to both Pip and... Um, so Pip has a husband, Pat, three children and four beautiful grandchildren. I Hi. thought it would be appropriate in a session titled Family Narratives to start with uh, the constitution of each person's family. She is the author of three books of creative nonfiction, Song for Rosaline, The War That Never Ended, New Zealand Veterans Remember Korea, and the award-winning Trust, A True Story of Women and Gangs. Pip has an MA in creative writing and runs a communications consultancy called Two Write with her husband. And just a few weeks ago, Copyright Licensing New Zealand and the New Zealand Society of Authors announced that Pip was the recipient of one of four research grants for which I imagine is going to be your next book project. And the project title at the moment is Some People Fill the Rain. And maybe we'll have time to talk a little bit about that later. So I asked Pip who she would nominate as the most influential writer on her writing practice. And, and she said Helen Garner, which means we have something in common because Helen Garner has been an enormous influence on me. And Pip has described her as uh, someone who started writing creative non-fiction long before it was fashionable and makes no apology for putting herself into her stories as a way of illuminating the people and subject matter in them. So, which has given you the courage to do the same. Yeah. So, Song for Rosaline, which we're going to be talking about today, is an intensely personal account of Pip and her family caring for, them, for her mother. And I think it's a, it's a really important book because it also sets in a broader context of what really is an impending global crisis um, with um, dementia. So we'll be looking at that a little bit more too. So welcome, Pip. <laughs> Emma um, Gilkinson has a husband, Roy Castilla, and two children. And I say that quite deliberately, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. She currently lives in Brisbane with, with Roy and their son, Amaru who I believe is here somewhere. Yep, yeah, down the back. Okay, <laughs> great, which is wonderful. Welcome, Amaru. Yeah. And uh, Adrienne, your mum is Andrea. Yeah. Andrea, yeah. sorry, Andrea, welcome. So Emma graduated with a diploma in journalism from Massey University and then worked as a freelance features writer and a columnist. Um, she's written for the Sunday Star Times and the Dominion. And in 2013, studied a Bachelor of Applied Arts in Creative Writing at Fitorea. She's also studied short fiction and science writing at Victoria University's International Institute of Modern Letters. So the three of us have all studied at the IIML. <laughs> <laughs> and her writing has appeared in newspapers and magazines. And I think you've written for the spin-off as well, is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. And Emma nominates as the author, author who has influenced her most, Barbara Kingsolver, who I'm sure is a fan of many of you in the audience. The Heart of Jesus Valentino, which is the book we'll be talking about today, is Emma's first book, and it's the story of how she and Roy had to make one the toughest decision of their lives, or a series of tough decisions, um, when they learnt that their unborn baby had a fatal heart condition. So I'd like to start, actually, by just asking you both to talk a little bit about the conditions. So um, ectopia cordis is a very, very rare disorder, um, making Jesus... 
um, you said the other day at the workshop, uh, almost a one in a, literally one in a million baby. And um, so it, it's very, very rare. And on the other hand, dementia is very, very common with one in five over the age of 80 um, likely to be diagnosed with it. And once we get to over the age of 90, it's one in two. So very, very common. But could you just tell us first, Emma, a little bit about um, the condition ectopia? Mm, sure. So um, ectopia cordis affects eight in a million babies. Um, and what it means is that the heart quite literally um, grows outside of the, the baby's chest. Um, in a handful of cases around the world, um, surgery has been carried out on babies with ectopia cordis and they have managed to put hearts back inside the chest. Um, but it, that wasn't possible in, in our baby's case. Um, while ectopia cordis babies are in the womb, they can grow normally and healthily because they're not having to do the job of breathing. So it's really um, once they're born that, that things get, get pretty tough for ectopia cordis babies. And um, there are very few stats or there's not a lot of information about the disorder because it's so rare, but we did hear that 90% um, of babies with ectopia cordis are either stillborn or will die in the first few hours after being born. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And Pip, could you just paint us a little bit of a picture of, um, of dementia, but in particular the vascular dementia mm. that your mother, Rosaline, had? Um, my mum, Rosaline, she had vascular dementia, which is the second most common kind. The, mo the one that everybody knows about is Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And there's many similarities. Um, but vascular dementia essentially happens when blood is uh, cut off from the brain. And it depends which parts of the brain are affected. Different parts can be affected, often through mini strokes and, um, or, or big strokes. And so the, the way it presents can be very different uh, for, from one person to another. Mm, great, thank you. So obviously these two books are stories about beloved family members who one at the beginning of his life and one at the end of her life, um, who have you, you cared for and then have passed away. So obviously extremely, probably the most challenging times of your life. And, but you were both writers going into these experiences. So I'm really curious to know, was it always a case of, oh yes, I'm definitely going to write a memoir about this story? Or was it something that you, you, it took some time to, to emerge? Um, perhaps Pip, you'd like to start and talk about when, when it became, when it went from just writing to make sense of it yourself. And I know I want to write this for a broader audience and, and share it with the world. Um, when mum, when mum got dementia, I was actually writing, um, going, starting to write my first book, and so I was starting to think about storytelling. And and during the time she had it, uh, I was in, I did a creative writing MA, and so I think it would be fair to say that I always wondered whether I might do something with the story, but I didn't take copious notes. Um, one thing I did do was keep all the emails between my siblings, and I've got five siblings, and over the course of Mum's Dementia, uh, we literally uh, sent thousands of emails regarding her care and our feelings about it, and that became my, um, the gold and the scaffolding of the story. It wasn't a simple matter after she died of just saying, this is my story and I'm going to write it, even though I felt very compelled to do that because there were a lot of reservations in my family uh, about making our, our mother's um, life private and particularly her memory loss and those last difficult years. And that really put the brakes on me for a, a long time. Um, until in the end I realised that the tension between me wanting to write the story and other people wanting it not to be told was never going to go away. And somehow I just had to manage this thing. Um, it was actually seven years after mum died. And looking back, I wonder if there was a greater wisdom at work because when I was in the throes of writing it, I read Mary Carr's uh, book, The Art of Memoir. And one of her 
points to uh, would-be memoirists is if the event you want to write about has happened less than seven or eight years earlier, it may be harder than you think. And then it was, for me, thinking it was actually my family that had held me up. I was like, ah, no, it wasn't. It was actually took that much time to get the perspective and distance, and it was the right time. Um, that big gap. Mm. Yeah. Emma, you obviously could probably speak from experience then about what it was right, like writing the, your story a little earlier than, than waiting seven years. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I journaled um, throughout my pregnancy, so that was my goal in terms of material for um, my memoir. And I guess, you know, throughout the pregnancy and my son's life, I felt I was going through such a profound um, experience where all sorts of amazing and, and unexpected things were happening. So um, I really wanted to share um, that with others. And I think um, going from journal entries to a book was also um, a way for me to honor my son's life. You know, it was, it was achingly brief. Um, 15 and a half days, um, but I really like the idea that ripples can still continue um, from, from his life. And yeah, as you say, I um, began trying to write my memoir in earnest maybe six months after he died. Um, I'm quite an impatient person. <laughs> I would probably push myself um, a little bit too much to um, get it done, to, to, to write it um, in the first year or so, I guess, after my son died. And certainly there was an advantage in that things had recently happened, so memories were quite fresh. Um, there was a disadvantage in that when it came to some of the things that I was writing about, I was still in the process of um, processing them, um, and particularly when I came to write about um, grieving after my baby died, the words just landed on the page in this chaotic jumble because I still wasn't quite clear in my mind myself um, about some of the responses that I'd had whilst grieving. Mm. How many drafts did you do, both do? Was it several drafts or only, only a few into, before it was published? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, several. Um, I guess including the drafts with um, the editor, I guess there must have been at least seven or eight. Yes. Many. Many. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Easy to lose count. <laughs> so let's discuss what was important to each of your families at Square One before Rosalind's memory loss became apparent um, and before your 12-week scan, Emma. Um, Pip, I, I was interested how you wrote about how private your mother was and when your father became ill, she, you know, many, many outsiders had no idea how deeply the brain tumour rocked your family and you described it as the cracks hidden beneath her spotless house and stoicism. How did this set the scene for you and your siblings when it became apparent she was starting to, you know, get dementia? Um, well, we had a very strong role model that you circle the wagons and get on with it, basically. Um, and because mum was such a private person, there also, I think we had a very strong sense of guilt about um, telling people that something was wrong with her. Uh, particularly when she didn't know that anything was wrong with her herself. And that's quite common with dementia. She actually couldn't remember that she couldn't remember. And um, it's a it's not denial. It's, it takes a long time to get your head around that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a documented condition called an anosognosia. Um, and it's the hardest thing about dementia, actually, because there's no um, processing, no ability to work things through. But because of um, your mum's example and mum's personality, we did keep her dementia very much to ourselves. I think also we were, we were surprised that friends didn't inquire of us uh, more. And I think that comes down to the way our society copes with things like dementia. People don't want to talk about it. They don't want to, you know, raise these difficult topics. Um, 
which was you know one of the motivations for me let's get this let's start talking mm. yeah. yeah yeah great mm. And, and Emma, you and Roy had been together, you know, you were a relatively new relationship mm -hmm. you, um, when you got pregnant. So just tell us about what, what it was like going in, into the experience, like where, sort of where Square One was in the way the fa your family unit worked. And, and then I'd like to perhaps invite you to do your little reading about decision making, which I think illustrates um, your, your dynamic. Yeah, sure. So um, my partner, Roy, hails from um, Peru. Um, he was named after um, a cowboy in a Western movie that his um, Peruvian parents like. Um, we'd been together um, for just over a year um, when I found out I was pregnant on Valentine's Day. Um, we were both um, really happy um, about that news. We Kids were on both of our radars. Um, we were still figur figuring out how to be a couple together. Um, yeah, Roy is, you know, wonderfully, um, a wonderfully spontaneous um, Latino. I'm a somewhat more um, organised Kiwi with perhaps better timekeeping skills. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and yeah, spiritually, I guess I was vaguely Buddhist and Roy was a lapsed Catholic. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's, I guess, square one for us. And I, I think there's this beautiful scene in your book where you illustrate the difference between his mountain and your, and your heart. Would you like to do that reading now? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Next morning, we walked along Paikokariki Beach, inhaling salty air, picking our way amongst the driftwood installations. The sky was breathtakingly blue and the sun unusually hot for late autumn. When we reached the end of the beach, we sat in the sand, leaning against big rocks. I told Roy about a phone conversation I'd had with Vicky Culling. I'd cut to the chase with the question I'd most wanted to ask. Do you think women who have terminations find the emotional process easier? Is the grief less than for women who continue pregnancies knowing their baby is going to die? Vicky had drawn a breath and begun with a caveat. There's no one size fits all answer. So much depends on the individual woman and her circumstances. That said, I don't think grief is any less one way or the other. In some cases, I've seen massive guilt and self-judgment arise in women who've chosen terminations, even though they felt their decision was rational. On the other hand, in some cases, I've seen a sense of peace in women who have continued pregnancies and farewelled babies after birth, maybe because they were able to make good memories through the pregnancy and in the things they did after their baby had passed. Vicky said it could be hard for friends and family to share in the grief and offer support after a termination, hard to comprehend the experience without baby photos or a casket. Vicky's words validated many of the hunches I'd been having, though I'd sensed an unspoken expectation in some family members and friends that I would terminate. Vicky had been at pains to emphasise that Sands supported families whatever decision they made. For some, terminating was the right thing to do. Roy listened quietly, then he said, But MZ, we know our son is going to die and we have to face that. If we continue the pregnancy, it's going to mean suffering for him when he's born. He'll die of suffocation. I don't want to do that to him. I don't want to watch that. But how do you know his soul wouldn't choose to have that brief experience of living? M maybe it's better to let nature take its course, I replied. If you're talking about souls, you're talking about mysteries we can never hope to understand, he said. We're his parents, and as parents, you must make choices, even if they are hard choices. We're going to have to let him go, and it will be easier to do that sooner rather than later. We didn't raise our voices through this conversation. We were willing to hear each other's arguments again. While we were talking, I'd absentmindedly drawn an outline of a heart in the sand and filled it with pebbles and fragments of driftwood. Roy, meanwhile, had made a small cone-shaped mountain with a seagull feather stuck on the top. Look, he said, gesturing towards our creations. You're thinking with your heart and emotion. 
I'm trying to view the situation more objectively from the top of a mountain. I thought it was arrogant of Roy to claim his perspective was more objective than mine, but I didn't say so. I dearly hoped my hut and his mountain would find a way to merge. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm. I think uh, in the RNZ interview, you described what was the big factor, the number one factor that made you go, yes, we're going to go ahead and continue with the pregnancy. Uh, it was about, you know, what would be the, the greatest act of love your that really influenced your decision? Yeah, yeah. certainly. Um, both Roy and I um, wanted to do whatever the greatest act of love was for our baby. We just had different answers for a while as to what that looked like. Um, I guess one way that I came to look at things was to ask myself what I would do if it was my mum or my dad who was given six months to live, um, whether I want to farewell them as quickly as possible or whether I'd want to cherish every moment that I had with them. And um, of course it was the latter, and it wasn't that different with my baby, um, albeit I knew that I would be loving him mostly while he was growing in my womb, um, and I didn't know how long, if any, time at all I would have with him after he was born. Um, I think if I'd heard of a woman making a decision like mine before I was in the situation, you know, I might have assumed she was a religious martyr or maybe she was just um, postponing the inevitable, running away from it. Um, but as often happens in life when we're in situations, our perspective can shift, you can mm. see things differently. Mm. And it turns out that that wasn't the only difficult decision you had to make. There, there were a whole series of other ones that unfolded that you couldn't have predicted, I guess, from the outset either about, um, you know, where, to, you know, all the various decisions you made around the time of the birth and that sort of thing too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, what, did, was there any particular decision you would describe as a real curveball that took you completely by su su surprise as you were going through the pregnancy? Was there something that... Hmm, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, the ultimate decision um, was whether, whether to continue the pregnancy, pregnancy or, or not. Um, but I think, you know, once we decided to continue, you know, Roy really rallied behind the decision. He didn't regret it at all once um, we decided that's what we were going to do. And I think that, you know, from that moment onwards, I had this real sense of trust and I had this great sense that I just had to love my baby. That, that, was, that was my job. And um, as long as I was doing that, um, then everything was kind of going to work out okay. Um, so I didn't find any decisions particularly difficult to um, make after that. Um, except for purchasing a house a week after our baby died, but um, that's another whole other tangent. Yeah, yeah. Well, which you actually document <laughs> in the book quite well. Yeah. yeah. Pip, can you tell us about some of the decisions you and, and your siblings had to make on, on behalf of your mother? Um, I think in particular, I was really interested in her reaction um, when the question of whether to, for antibiotics and the decision she'd made about your father. Um, so, so you were in a, a situation where you couldn't always involve her in decision making that had a big impact on, on her life. Yes, I, I alluded to that before when I said, you know, that's the most difficult thing about dementia, I think, is that with any other illness, you'd involve the person in every aspect of the decision making. That's what we do. Um, that's the right thing to do. Um, but it doesn't work with dementia. and. It's um, particularly if the person doesn't really know they've got dementia. And the antibiotic decisions one, but but the you know the obvious things were things like when mum um, couldn't drive anymore, and the two big ones, not being able to drive anymore and having to leave her house. And um, she lived alone. My dad had died a number of years earlier, so she was um, a widow living alone in a big house. And and me and my siblings, we we tried to keep her there as long as we could. Um, but when we had inevitably to make decisions 
she couldn't understand why her family would want to take away her independence or um, it was heartbreaking, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Mm. One of the things both of you have done really, really well has is being very honest about some of the challenges in, in the dynamics of decision-making and, and communication with your family members. And I really appreciate that in both of the books. I mean, Pep, you've written a little bit about you know, your brother and your brother Matt and you seeing slightly um, diff different... Oh, there's a big blowfly. <laughs> um, having a different approach to some of the decisions you're making and, and different lenses on the situation. And Emma, I love the way you write so honestly about your, um, you know, your and Roy's, you know, negotiating around things and, and how that deepens your relationship and your intimacy as time goes by. But I'm curious, what did Roy and Matt both think about the books when they first read them? Um, perhaps Pip, when you... Um, Matt was my greatest supporter, mm, uh, great. right from the start. Uh, the whole idea, the and the execution, and um, so he he was fine. Uh, it wasn't entirely straightforward with other others of my siblings, and that I think is inevitable in a big family. And you know, one of the things that I was very clear about was this is a story about my mother, that if any of my siblings had written about this experience, they actually would have written about their mother. And while I use the emails to try and give uh, a wider perspective, and, that, and all my siblings were so generous in allowing me to use their emails, even the ones who really would have rather there was no book, um, that's the way I've managed to bring in their voices. But, you know, this is my mother. Mm. The mother in my head. Mm. And Emma, what about Roy? I, I think you've said that he, he was actually incredibly happy for the book to be out there in the world too. Is that right? Or was there some... Uh, yes, I mean, happy in that. I think he too um, loves to talk about our son, Jesus Valentino. So um, for him, it also felt good... Um, to share our, our son's life and our journey from that perspective. Um, yeah, you're quite right. I've written a lot about our arguments um, in the book, much more than I have um, about the times when, you know, things are just kind of ho-hum and going relatively well. Um, and if you happen to read the book, you'll see that when Roy and I argue, in about 99% of cases I'm justified and right. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was, I was really lucky to have a very um, generous, um, graceful partner um, who read the book and whilst um, it's certainly not um, the book that he would have written. He said, look, Emma, this is, this is your story. So, um, you know, you tell it how you tell it how you need to, to tell it. Um, so I was very grateful to him for mm. that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pip, in the book, you actually write about the um, challenges, the problems inherent in memoir um, about that single point of view. Um, there's this one great scene, I think, where you talk about your sister took your mum out for the day and, and she came back and reported about what had happened. And it, it, was, it was quite you know, eye-opening for you to, to, to see that that was quite different from, from what you had been immersing yourself in, so that's very evident. But would you like to share your reading now? Because I think it's a lovely portrayal of the, the, the challenges and, and also um, the, the, you know, just a little bit of a portrayal of, of your mother in the, in the scene that you're going to share with us. Sure. Um, you, you need to know, this is this far on in the story. So mum's still living at home. We're getting increasingly concerned about her. She's living alone in a big house. Um, she's becoming very forgetful, and we're worried about her driving. Um, we're not sure how long she can stay there. We're finding it very difficult to get uh, medical kind of professional support. And um, so we ask for a psychogeriatric assessment. And at the same time, mum is still very eloquent and... Uh, has a lot of insight, and you will see how that plays out in this little scene. Back then, it was hard not to envy those with easier relationships with mum. 
Somehow my mother and I always seemed to end up at loggerheads, often over her health, as we did on the wet November afternoon when a psychiatrist, nurse and registrar filled mum's stuffy lounge with their black coats, bollies and briefcases. No one had told us the psychogeriatric assessment would require a team of three experts. I left mum in their clutches while I made coffee. When I returned with the tray, the psychiatrist asked her if she had any concerns about her memory loss. No, mum said. She sat in her chair by the fire like a sullen child, her scrawny arms folded, her mouth set in a grim line. She might not have known exactly who these people were, but when it came to sensing danger, she was an expert. The psychiatrist turned to me with an inquiring look. I felt my cheeks flush. Surely he didn't expect me to contradict mum in front of his team. That's why we'd called him in to get an independent opinion so we could stop being the bad guys. I muttered something about being worried about her. What for, mum said sharply, and I retreated into silence. My heart sank as mum answered the usual questions about her age and address and the day of the week, drew the correct time on a clock face, made a perfect copy of a diagram. I hoped the psychiatrist realised these tests were a waste of time for her. The only time she faltered was when he gave her three words and asked her to repeat them a minute later and 15 minutes after that. By the second time, I'd forgotten one of the words myself. <laughs> He asked about her driving. Warning signs are things like little dings going in and out of the garage, he said. We've had a few of those, I ventured. Mum turned to him and put on her haughtiest voice. You know who's done them, don't you? <laughs> One of my daughters. <laughs> she might as well have pointed at me. I suppressed an urge to laugh. Over all, though, the visit was depressing. The psychiatrist said there was no test to determine a person's level of dementia or the right time for them to leave their home. It was up to us to judge mum's safety. In fact, it was up to us to do everything, it seemed. After the team had gone, mum and I huddled at the end of her dining table, wrung out, soft with each other. She mentioned she needed supervision when I think she meant to say support, a slip up so astute, my eyes pricked with tears. Then, as if to rectify the error, she said, I'll know when I can't live here anymore, but I don't think I'm ready to be shipped out yet. Afraid of losing hard won ground, I plunged into the unspeakable. At some stage, it's going to come down to three choices, Mum, I said. Fear flickered in her eyes, but I ploughed on. Someone can come and live with you. Hmm, she snorted. A boarder. That would be the end of me. Or you can come and live with one of us. Hmm, that would be the end of you. <laughs> I swallowed hard. Or you can go into some sort of supported living. I avoided words like rest home and care, but both of us knew what I meant. When she finally spoke, it was in a whisper. I hope I die before that happens. The diagnosis of dementia is really fraught, isn't it? And you, you have a lot, did, did you get any, ex have you got any advice for people? Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, ask it straight out. Yes, go to the community organisations. <laughs> They're the best. They're the ones who know. They're the ones that listen to family. We found it very hard to get a diagnosis from health professionals, including the geriatrician at the local hospital. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. One was that mum did present so well. Um, the other is that the medical model is a patient focused, which is admirable in every other context, but is not, does not work when the person's an unreliable witness to their own life, as that shows. Um, 
And thirdly, I suppose they're, to be fair to them, uh, they're trying not to pigeonhole people, but actually we felt we were the ones going mad, to be perfectly honest. If, um, you know, if mum passed all the tests and if the geriatrician, when I asked him, specifically said it wasn't dementia, then, you know, where did that leave us? So it was the Alzheimer's Society when I rang who over the phone, when I said mum was becoming so forgetful, isolating herself, um, etc., said everything you've told me says it's dementia. And it was like, thank heavens somebody is acknowledging it. But you did eventually get a medical diagnosis of vascular dementia, did you? Um, yes, well actually even the geriatrician said she had cerebral vascular disease but denied that that was dementia and I'm not quite sure how that, I still really, I, I tried in the book actually to go back and talk to him only to discover that he had died as well and so it wasn't possible to um, to ask him what he'd meant. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And I think as, as your book progresses and you are then into the aged care system, you have some other, I, I found it really useful reading it in terms of preparing myself. My mother has the early stages of dementia too, um, about some of the things that we'll need to take into consideration. But can you, is it possible to say how the health, the medical profession could have been more helpful or do you think it's just an institutional thing that it's... Um, possibly the one thing I think they need to do is listen to family mm. and make opportunity. It was actually very difficult even to get an opportunity to speak to the geriatrician independently or mum's GP. And yeah, don't just take the person's word for it. If family are saying there's something wrong, there's something wrong. Mm. Yeah. And Emma, you've also written about um, the sort of institutional support that was available to you. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and where it worked and where you think it could be more helpful for mm. families like yours? Sure. So. Um, we were um, under the care of some um, incredible medical professionals. Um, we um, had a wonderful neonatologist who had the stroke of genius to um, suggest that uh, Jesus Valentino be the first baby to be admitted to Mary Potter Hospice in, in Wellington um, in the second week of his life. Um, and that was a great um, decision for many reasons. It was a really, really wonderful environment to be with our baby and um, for our friends and family to come and be with us as well. Um, we had a very wonderful um, neonatal nurse who gave up time on her own weekends so that she could um, accompany us on outings um, with our baby. So. We went to uh, my Buddhist centre, um, we went to a Catholic Mass on All, All Souls Day, um, we went to Zealandia, the wildlife sanctuary, the home of the Compassion Gardens, and uh, she was also a photographer, so she took all these photos and then presented us with this amazing album, um, uh, yeah, on the day of JB's funeral, actually. Um, so we had some very good experiences, but I guess my um, observation overall of the health system um, is that there's not really a clear pathway for families who make decisions like the one that we did. So the medical term for continuing a pregnancy when you know your baby is going to die is called um, perinatal palliative care. Um, and in some countries, um, it's a more... Um, commonly understood choice to make and there are more supports in place for families who do. Um, it's a more unusual decision to make um, in New Zealand and um, I think that we felt like a lot of the support that we got during the pregnancy was from outside the um, hospital system rather than within it. Um, and, you know, um, I certainly respect the decision that other families 
might make to terminate a pregnancy in the face of an abnormal diagnosis. Um, but I also think it's really important for medical professionals to um, present options in a, in a neutral way. So, for example, um, you know, for us, there was a brochure which talked about late-term terminations and what happens there, but there wasn't the equivalent brochure for perinatal palliative care or hospice in the womb and what that might look like. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> My next question was actually about um, bereavement, but I feel like we, we just need to spend a, a little moment um, hearing from you about those 15 days of, of Jesus Valentino's life. Can you just share with us some of the joy of, of, that, of that time? Yeah, sure. So um, we called his best Valentino JV for, for short, much less of a, a mouthful. Um, and also, you know, Jesus is quite a common name in South America. Um, Roy had his heart set on calling our baby Jesus. First of all, I was like, no way, people are going to think that we're calling our baby God. <laughs> um, but through um, dint of repetition, he, he talked me around. Um, and I chose Valentino because of the Valentine's Day connection. And, you know, Valentino means um, valiant in Latin. Um, so we were just, of course, overjoyed to meet our baby, as any new parents are. Um, and we really expected we would have very little time with him. So when he lived for 15 and a half days, we were just, they were days of miracle and wonder. We kind of couldn't believe it every morning when we woke up and he was with us. And um, it gave us time to really get to know him. It, it gave us time to introduce, it, introduce him to lots of people. Um, he was much healthier than anyone had ever expected he would be. Um, he, was, he wasn't in a neonatal ward in an, in an incubator. He was, he was with us. Um, and um, yes, um, so it was, such a, it was such an incredibly special time. Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of makes me sort of feel almost dreamlike talking about it because it was like this time that existed, existed in a slightly different zone. And we were surrounded by such love and such compassion. And I feel like one of the things that my son's life did was to give me kind of new yardsticks to measure what um, real compassion looks like and, and what it's like when you're connecting with everyone around you from, from the heart. Because I think my son, in a way, he kind of brought out the best in everyone. Um, a, as I think, you know, can often happen um, when we're close to um, someone dying. You know, it becomes very apparent what's important and, and what's not. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was utterly amazing. Yeah, I could go on and on. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah. I think, I mean, what you both had in common was knowing, you know, ahead of time that um, Jesus and, and Rosaline were were dying and were going to die. And I, I, I read, I actually saw Philip Hoare at Word in Christchurch, and he was speaking about a friend with Alzheimer's and noted that she died before she died. Pip, did you have that experience of the grieving starting starting much earlier than? then, you know, did you start to grieve over those? I'm, sh I'm sure I did, um, because, you know, I did, I lost my mum over that five years while I lost the person that she'd been. But I also um, realised that I gained some things as well. And... Probably it's easier to see that in retrospect than it was at the time. Um, one of the things about mum is that she'd been, like many women of her generation, she'd spent her life uh, caring for other people, putting everyone else's needs before her own. Uh, and this wasn't entirely a good thing. In fact, it was really the reason that she ended up with unmonitored high blood pressure, which you know, led to her dementia. So being completely self-effacing is not necessarily you know, desirable. Um, but when she got dementia, what happened really was her spirit became fierce, as it had to. 
And while dementia took everything from her, it, it sort of restored her intuition. And uh, as I say, that was difficult dealing with at the time and really um, it took me some time after she died to appreciate, yeah, that I hadn't only lost my mother, I'd also discovered a, a new side to her that I believe had always been there. Mm. And I think her sense of humour comes through beautifully um, in, in the book too. Yeah. Emma, you don't actually use the word lost um, to describe... Um, Hey, could you tell us a little bit more about your, your decision not to use that word lost? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, after JB died, um, you know, we do talk about losing someone, you know, a, a mother's lost her baby. But it felt a little bit wrong to me to say that because, um, because JB didn't feel lost to me. He still felt um, very close to me in many ways, and I wanted him to stay um, to stay close to me. Um, I think that one of the things that helped me in the grieving process was the idea that actually when someone dies, our relationship with them doesn't have to end forever. Um, we can stay in relationship with them, even if it's just through being in relationship with our memories of them. Um, or, you know, depending on your beliefs, maybe you can also be in relationship with their spirit in some way. Um, so, yeah, there was also the idea that, um, you know, you don't have to stop loving someone when they, when they die. And that was really important mm -hmm. for me as a, as a new mum because I did want to keep loving and I wanted to keep mothering too. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I've done things like I've made um, birthday cakes for, for JB um, ever since he died and... Um, for his grave, um, I, I hand painted tiles, which um, which tile his grave. So I guess for me, yeah, those were those were kind of acts of care and mothering um, that I'm kind of doing whilst he's not here physically. Mm. I mean, memory making has been shown to be very helpful in helping people in a bereavement. I know from my own experience, and the ultimate memory making, I think, is is writing a memoir ab about our loved ones. So what, what did, I, I'm interested in, let's put aside the question of dementia, but I'm interested about what you learnt about your own memory, Pip, in, in writing the book. Um, you explained, for example, the humanity and the importance of forgetting, and you know, that we all have to forget things. It's part of who we are. We'd go crazy <laughs> if we remembered everything. Could you talk a little bit more about that experience? Mm. Um, well, I think... Basically, it gave me a terror of the um, shortcomings of my own memory. Um, and, you know, I have at times in my life been convinced that I've got dementia. Um, and I talk about a particular episode in the book, um, which I found yeah, very was good for me because it made me realise just how devastating it is to think that you are losing your ability to discern and to remember and to um, you know, be in the world. Um, you're right that, you know, I do, I do at some point say, you know, if we, forgetting is the, is the way that we get on with life. If we remembered everything, we'd be in complete overload and we'd have sort of crumbled um, into a little heap. Having said that, um, you know, I'd like to hang on to my memory. Um, and, and that, you know, while I also sort of was very interested in Buddhist ideas of, you know, living in the now, um, with mum I saw, which is what she ended up doing really, um, that being untethered to the past and unable to imagine the future is actually terrifying. Um, and that we became her anchor. Uh, to be, from someone who had been so self-sufficient, to be alone was to be lonely because she didn't have any markers to sort of anchor herself. And um, in her dementia, I may have strayed from the question, um, you know, mum sort of clamoured for connection, absolutely demanded connection. And uh, that, you know, that, 
now I look back on it, was wonderful, really. And I think is, is, is really what we all clamour for once our persona and once um, you know, our ways of being in the world are taken away from us. Yeah, she worked out what was the most important thing, didn't she? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was curious though about you. You talk about Mark Twain's um, quote about lying towards the truth and and that kind of role of, you know, memorising and recreation in the act of writing mm. memoir. Um, and you, you actually, I loved your term, literary therapeutic fibbing. <laughs> <laughs> was some of this needed in the book, or did you, you have? Yeah, I mean, you had all those emails to rely upon, but mm. was there a little bit of uh, literary therapeutic fibbing in there. <laughs> well, you need to know what therapeutic fibbing is first, and this was the, the sort of the wonderful piece of advice from the Alzheimer's field worker, which is you, you, if you go head to head with someone with dementia, if they say, I want to go to the bank at five o'clock on Sunday night, and you know, they no longer operate their own bank account, you know, if you say, you know, don't be ridiculous, you can't manage money and we're doing it for you, you know, that the escalation just um, goes on and on. So what you do is you, um, you look at the emotion behind the words, which is, I'm worried about money. Um, I need to be reassured, you know. And you deflect, you, you know, let's have a cup of tea, then we'll go to the bank. Um, you know, you, you agree, yes, money's really important, you know. Well, let's make sure that there's plenty of money in your purse. I found this very challenging because I was a person who believed in telling the truth and nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. And I also thought my mother would know that I was lying to her. Um, you know, I've been brought up not to lie to people. So that's therapeutic fibbing, is to, is to look at the emotion behind the words. And I sort of realised that when you write a book, actually you can't recreate absolutely accurately every scene but that your, you know, your duty is, is, is not to fabricate anything when you're writing a book of non-fiction knowingly and, to, and to, you know, to head straight for the emotion behind the scene and to make sure that you convey that. Then you're, you're, you're halfway there. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, it's tied in also with the other conundrum of memoir writing is that um, to produce a, a, a literary... P um, piece, you have a beginning, a middle, and you need an end. You have to have an end at some point. And of course, life keeps going on. Emma, you shared with me that lovely expression of you never step in the same river twice. Can you tell us how you can reconcile your awareness of this with how memories are, how memories are constantly constructed and reconstructed with the need to actually finalise the book and come to, come to an ending in it? Mm, yeah, so I guess um, in the same way as we never step in the same river twice, you never read the same version of your manuscript twice, and that, you know, every reading you have a slightly different perspective. Um, maybe something that seemed very important at one point doesn't seem so important anymore, and something else you've heard recently, um, you know, gives you a new idea or something else you might like to, to add. Um, I think when it came to... Uh, the end of my memoir, um, I certainly wanted to end it um, in a place where it was clear that Roy and I um, were out of the intense um, grieving stage. Um, I wanted to show people that um, you can have a baby who's died and you can still go on and live happy lives. And, and in our case, you know, our baby, um, he... Uh, as a source of love for us. We, we, we talk about him easily. Um, it's, not a, it, it's not like his legacy is one of pain. His, his legacy is one of, one of love in our lives. Um, so the ending of my book is um, actually about this time last year, which was um, JV's third birthday. Um, as I mentioned before, <laughs> I was making him a birthday cake and my son Amaru, who's back there, was, um, was blowing out the candles. Um, and I talk about how um, that day in, in Brisbane, where we now live in Australia, we went to uh, an exhibition by a um, wonderful Japanese artist, um, a dot installation, Life is the Heart of the Rainbow is the name of the exhibition. It came to New Zealand as well, um, and people could place multicoloured dots on the walls. So um, I placed um, my dots, you know, to spell out JV's name on his birthday. Um, 
I guess I would just also add that it's like I feel like my son's story is still unfolding and will keep on, on unfolding. So if I was still writing the book now, it's like I might add that um, uh, about a month ago, um, my toddler Amaru sat um, upright in bed at 5.30 a.m. and said, um, Mommy, baby crying. Jesus Valentino flying in the sky comes to give Mummy a big hug. Um, and then he just lay down and went straight back to sleep. Um, yeah, or equally, um, we're currently working with the Victor Chan Cardiac Institute in Sydney, who's their, um, I guess, one of the most em eminent researchers of um, fetal heart development and um, heart disease in general. And so we're working with them on their Christmas fundraising appeal. We've let them use our photos and our son's story. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was delighted the other day when I was talking with the fundraising manager and she said, oh, we think we're going to launch the campaign on October the 26th. Um, and my baby, Hesbeth Valentina, was born on October the 26th. So yeah, so that's next, next week. Next week is his fourth birthday, next Friday. Yeah. It's great timing that you're here then talking about it. Do we have any questions? We've got a roving mic just up here. Good afternoon. I'm looking at my notes because I have short-term memory loss, <laughs> and undiagnosed, um, and there were so many points that I wanted to question. I'm here on behalf of a young 30-year-old friend. Her mother was diagnosed with dementia at 48, and she's now 52. My friend has three children under five. Her mum has been in a dementia care facility here in Stoke for the past three years. And of course, surrounded by most of them much, much older, who are treated as old people by the carers. My friend is so frustrated that she can't find the care with the right qualified carers for somebody in her 50s. My young friend's emotions range from obviously absolute sadness to anger, frustration. Uh, why has it happened to her? Her mother has never met her three boys and she's devastated by that. She feels guilt that she should go and see her more regularly with one-year-old teething, keeping her up at night a feisty four-year-old and a, a gentle, caring five-year-old who doesn't know why mum is crying all the time. As well as me buying the book for her, is there anything, Pip, that you can... I mean, the system being the way it is. Mm. Please. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, I totally feel for uh, people who get dementia earlier. Mum was in her early 70s, and that felt devastatingly young. Um, and the system leaves a lot to be desired uh, for older people as well. Uh, um, there's an avalanche of dementia on the way. Uh, a lot of the care is tied up with big retirement villages who really uh, have a, you know, a, a motive for their shareholders. And dementia care is a, is, requires basic things, but a lot of personal attention. Until we, as a society, make it a priority, uh, there's going to be many, many people in your friend's mother's situation and my mum's situation. My friend just wants her to hurry up and die. Yeah, I can understand that. And that's that. understandable. And then say she feels the guilt and so on. So, thank you. Was there another question over this side? Yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt. And because we are a little tight on time, if it could be a question, and you will have the opportunity to come and chat to both Pip and Emma afterwards if you need to go into, yeah. No, that's okay, that was okay. Yeah, just Here's an, an another question for, for Pip. Um, you mentioned the three experts that arrived to do the diagnosis, which you had hopes for. Um, could you just perhaps give us a few 
examples, practical examples of the sort of things that were happening to your mother uh, in, you know, that concerned you and, and the family, you know, examples? Sure. Um, one that strikes me is that mum was still in command of her checkbooks at that stage and, you know, she would be firing off cheques to, uh, in response to direct debit letters. Um, she would be turning up at appointments with the doctor that she hadn't made. And that was quite good, because that actually gave the doctor, that was when the doctor Evidence. began to realise <laughs> that, oh, maybe there was something wrong. Um, we had red flags all over town with the, um, with the dentist that she kept going and having dental work done you know, the, the, fire, the firewood people who she kept ordering um, quantities of firewood, you know, just say yes to mum and then ring us. Uh, so it was, she appeared, she was trying desperately, I think, to maintain a normality and be the consummate housewife and home manager that she'd always been. But the behaviour was becoming more and more erratic and we were sort of rushing around trying to... Um, you know, fight all these fires, apart from the fact of we knew she was losing weight, you know, we knew she would forget to lock her door, um, things like, the little things like that. So the, the, these are the signals. I mean, the trouble with dementia, it's not, it doesn't come like a thunderclap. It starts off with a slightly weird, oh, you know, mum, mum rang up and thought I was you, you know, to my sister, for example, um, and then seems fine. Oh, well, you know. And so it, it creeps up slowly until one day you think, this is not right. This is more than aging. Yeah. But that time bef beforehand is the most difficult, I think, really. Well, it, the whole thing's difficult. But that is particularly difficult. Mm. Mm. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I'm sure Pip and Emma would be happy to... Um, have a chat to you afterwards. But I'd just like to finish by asking one quick question of both of you. It's the big question, but one quick answer from you. And um, The death of a family often forces one to contemplate the big and existential questions. And just one answer that each of you found, and I've got your answers written here, that, so if you need help, I can remind you <laughs> what you wrote in your book. But um, yeah, but yeah, would you like to share one, one of the things that you, you learnt from your experience? Um, yeah. um, goodness, one thing. Well, you know, the obvious thing is live every moment. You don't know uh, when it's going to change. And probably the other is um, I believe that a contributor to mum's dementia, the way it presented, was possibly the way that she was so stoic and suppressed a lot of grief and emotion during her adult life, uh, oh, and her childhood, actually. And so my sort of message is, you know, let's try and be a little more open about uh, the fact that life is messy and difficult, and that's okay. And that was the answer that I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Emma, what was, what's the one really big lesson you learnt about how to live well from Jesus Valentino's life? I'm really curious as to what your, your answer is. I, I, I guess I have a few answers popping up in my head. Um, one of them um, is um, to quote uh, Joseph Campbell, um, the cave we fear to enter holds the treasure that we seek. Um, at least sometimes, um, you know, we, we can find love and, and meaning and hope um, in quite unexpected places. Um, and I think that the more we can um, open our hearts to each other and uh, live with compassion and, and live in a way that's, that really honours our, our truth, um, the better... But what's your answer of my answer? Well, it was very similar. It was, it was actually, you said the other day about how great pain births great love. Yeah. yeah. So on that note, I'd like, um, please join me in thanking Pip Desmond and Emma Gilkinson.